Hello, namaste. I'm Ruchira Gupta, your host for the podcast A Free Voice. I'm an Emmy-winning journalist who went on to start Apneya, an NGO which works against sex trafficking. I have dedicated my life to amplifying voices of the most marginalized people in the world. I'm also the debut author of scholastic book I Kick and I Fly. In this podcast, I will talk to survivors, activists and storytellers who use their voice to make a difference in the lives of young people. How does an idea turn into action? How do you change a tragedy into recognizing your own powers? Together, we will examine and reimagine the world we want. I don't know what the next phase of my life will bring, but I am excited to find yet another adventure, and I am sure that I will dive in with gusto and panache and enjoy the hell out of it. What I am categorically certain of right now is that it's my turn. After decades of helping extraordinarily talented men tell their stories, I realized it took me so long to tell my own because I believed myself smaller and less important that my role was limited to support. Well, the butterfly has emerged from her cocoon and is spreading her wings. What I am asking of the world is simply to imagine that I exist. I have been thinking a lot about visibility and erasure. I believe that any of us who live on the margins have been effaced to some degree, some more than others, of course. It's as if the dominant culture has a huge and redoubtable brush that systematically, fastidiously, and efficiently paints over us like a new coat on the slats of a white picket fence. And what that means is that we have to fight to be seen. You may not like what you see, but you will see me, motherfucker. My very being is an act of defiance. Think about it. I am a 57-year-old Asian single mother of two who is out here announcing to the world in no uncertain terms, with not an iota of compunction, that I am the baddest bitch in the room. And I think that's fucking radical. I am not allowing the dominant culture to tell me who I am. I am defining myself and telling the world who I am. You just heard Sophia Chang. From her book, The Baddest Bitch in the Room, her memoir. Sophia has been a screenwriter, author. She's developed numerous television properties. She's been the manager of many famous hip-hop artists, uh, ranging from Q-Tip and Dirty Bastard, RZA, GZA, A, D'Angelo, Raphael Sadiq, and many more. She's also worked with Paul Simon. She has now decided to use her voice to make a difference in the lives of others with a new venture called Unlock Her Potential. So, Sophia, tell me about this journey. How did you find your voice and how did you use it to finally reach where you are today? Well, Ruchira, I would have to start from childhood. So many of our stories start in childhood, don't they? They're rooted there. I was born in 1965 in Vancouver to Korean immigrants. I was a yellow girl in a white world who wanted to be white, like so many of us, first generation immigrants of color. And I rejected my culture. I didn't like our food. I lost the language. I was ashamed of my parents' names and their accents. I got called a chink, a jap, and a gook any number of those epithets and any cocktail combination of them. And then in 12th grade, I heard the message by Grandmaster Flash in The Furious Five. It's the first time I heard hip hop and I was thunderstruck. J'étais bouleversé, as the French would say. And it completely changed my life. I was undone. And I moved to New York in 1987. I skipped my university graduation Shout out to any Asian children of immigrants who skipped their college <laughs> or university graduation. And I moved to New York and I ensconced myself in the world of hip hop. And it was the most alive and seen that I had ever felt. 
there was an acceptance and an embrace and a love there that I had never experienced before outside of family, naturally. And it was a privilege. It was a massive privilege. In 1987, the hip hop scene in New York was still relatively small. It was a burgeoning industry. So to get in that early was a tremendous opportunity for me. And this was long before what we see now, which is a global, massive enterprise. I believe that hip hop is the greatest cultural force on the planet. And being able to be up close and personal with the creative process and watching a movement and a revolution happen was phenomenal. So I managed what I would say is a cadre of some of the greatest storytellers of our lifetime. I believe, looking at the sign here, this is Bowery Poetry Studios, I believe that hip hop is poetry. I believe it Absolutely. is literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe there they are words that are meant to be felt and heard. And I did everything that I could to assist in that process. And whatever small impact I may have had, I'm grateful to have had the opportunity. I left hip hop in 1995 when I met my Kung Fu master, uh, my Shifu, his name is Shi Yan Ming. He's a 34th generation Shaolin monk. And I just made a hard ride out of music. I fell in love. I ran his temple. I was training 15 hours a week. We had two children. And it occurs to me that I, who did, never did martial arts and never watched Kung Fu movies, was part of my rejection of my culture. I started watching Kung Fu movies because of Wu-Tang Clan. I decided I wanted to train in Kung Fu because I watched those movies. I went to the USA Shaolin Temple because I wanted to train in the most authentic style of Shaolin Kung Fu. I met Shi Yan Ming because I went to the USA Shaolin Temple. And if we go all the way back, it means that if it was not for Wu-Tang Clan, I would not have the children I have today. I would not maintain a practice of training in Kung Fu six days a week. So did you fall in love with Kung Fu first or your husband first? Kung Fu. Is that how you met him? Mm -hmm. I would say that those things, you know, Kung Fu I fell in love with through the movies. And um, for anybody that hasn't watched Kung Fu movies or Asian action movies in general. I think that Asian filmmakers have the ability to make action movies profoundly philosophical in a way that I don't think Western people can. A manifest example of that is a film called The Departed. Um, Excuse me, a manifest example of that is a film called um, Infernal Affairs, which was directed, I believe, by, um, is it Andy Lau, Andrew Lau? Um, and it was adapted by Scorsese and I believe won the Academy Award as The Departed. And The Departed is an enjoyable movie. It's nowhere near the film that Infernal Affairs is. It's interesting because, you know, I have been dealing with Kung Fu and uh, Karate in my own work against sex trafficking, where I had initiated Kung Fu and Karate classes for children of women in prostitution growing up in red light areas, just as a way to stop the bullying. And I was hoping they would knock the teeth down of a few traffickers. Mm -hmm. And what I, found, what I found was that uh, the kids began to also imbibe the philosophy of self-knowledge, self-awareness. And then that led to them understanding their own bodies. And it brought such a profound transformation that those girls were not only able to break a few burning tiles, stop the bullying, win gold medals, but they finally went on to college and break so many glass ceilings which they were born into. And that is now, uh, you know, 
the script or uh, the story of a book I've written called I, Cook, I Kick and I Fly, which is coming out by Scholastic. When is it coming out, Ruchiro Gupta? April, April 2023. Just a Mark few more. Mark your moments. calendars, everybody. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I, for me, uh, what was very intriguing um, about you, Sophia Chang, was how uh, you made the journey from hip hop to Kung Fu. What what was it? How did it happen? I mean, I think it was pretty organic. It, you know, I never had to exercise because I was blessed with my mother's hummingbird metabolism. But I knew that I wanted to stay fit. And again, meeting Wu-Tang Clan and watching those movies and discovering this aspect of my culture, of broader Asian culture that I had run away from. You know, I remember my brother said, ha, Sophia, you know, most of us go through our Asian Renaissance at 15. You waited until you were 30. <laughs> but once it was like hip hop. Once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Once I heard it, I couldn't unhear it. Once I felt it, I couldn't unfeel it. And the highest forms of martial arts will be deeply infused with philosophy. So it's not about making your body strong, because you can just go to the gym for that. It's about making your mind and body and spirit powerful. There's a difference between strength and power to me. Strength is the guy that gets strapped to a train car and can pull a train across tracks and God bless him, but that's not power. Bruce Lee had power. And I have no doubt that Bruce Lee's power came from the fact he was a philosophy major. He wrote a book called Jeet Kune Do that was very philosophical. You know, at Shaolin, we say there is no Shaolin martial arts without Chan Buddhism, and there is no Chan Buddhism without martial arts. They were, they were completely tied to each other. So I am a Buddhist. I cannot sit here and recite sutras. I cannot tell you about all of the text. But I know that I live a path that I do my best to honor what Buddha said and what Bodhidharma said, who was the Indian monk who migrated to China and to the Shaolin Temple in particular. And that's where Chan Buddhism was founded, was at Shaolin Temple. That's right. And it's, uh, you know, Bruce Lee, when he died, was in the middle of making a philosophical film, which was about the journey of a monk in India and who's also a Kung Fu fighter but how he uses different tools to fight, which become more and more nonviolent as he goes along life's journey. I mean, people ask me if I've ever used my Kung Fu. I say, oh, sweetie, I use my Kung Fu every day. I've never struck anybody. I've never kicked anybody. The only circumstance that would provoke that reaction out of me is if I was defending myself or some, a friend. I think I would feel really ill if I hurt somebody physically. But Kung Fu is everything. Kung Fu is sleeping. <laughs> it's eating. It's drinking. Can I curse? Of course. It's fucking. It's riding my bike. It's dancing. It's negotiating. It's mentoring. Everything is Kung Fu. And once you get to that point, it's so elevated and it's so beautiful. You know, people say, how can I, you know, how can I start working out like you? And I always say, you just start and you want to get to the point where it becomes habit. We have bad habits and we have good habits. Kung Fu is a habit for me. And when I say that, I mean that it is ritualized into my life. It is routine in my life. As regularly as I do all of those things that I just mentioned, eating, drinking, sleeping, bathing, I do Kung Fu. So if you just start and you do it more and more and more with more frequency and more regularity, it will get to the point, and this is with so many things in life, Ruchira, that it's actually harder 
not to do it than to do it. Absolutely. It would be very, I do not remember the last time I didn't exercise two days in a row. I don't remember. I take Sundays off, which is tomorrow. But other than that, I'm at the gym six days a week. And during the pandemic, I worked out in my small living room because my body is my temple, which I honor and clean every day. And my body is a high performance machine, which I honor and I run every day. It has to contain it. I have to maintain it. And did you have to come to this realization through Kung Fu because of the sexism that is there in the hip hop industry? Was it there then? How did you face it? I know that in your book and the extract that you just read from your book, The Baddest Bitch in the Room, you mentioned that you were supporting the careers of very famous hip hop artists, but you didn't have your own voice. But was that also because of the sexism in the hip hop industry besides just being a manager and not the person who's making the music? I mean, sure. Hip hop is an intrinsically male, therefore patriarchal and sexist and at times misogynist genre. But I would say that of the world. Um, martial arts is a very male milieu. I've worked in cannabis, a very male-dominated milieu, white male to that point. I was never conscious. Certainly I was conscious of the fact that I was a woman, but I wasn't conscious of being oppressed because I was a woman in any way. Part of that is that I just, my eyes weren't open enough and I was young. And part of it, Ruchir, is that I was granted a singular space in hip hop. And this was due almost uniquely to Wu-Tang Clan and the place that they made for me. They built a throne for me. And what I mean by that is they welcomed me immediately into their world. They welcomed me as a member of their family and they protected me like a little sister. They are to this day highly protective of me and I of them. So I walked around with this kind of <laughs> cloak of invulnerability because once I met Wu-Tang Clan, I never let them go. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just stuck on to them. And people knew, people were very, very clear, oh, Sophie is down with Wu-Tang. Like that's... That's their girl. And they are nine. And nine of them is actually more like a hundred when they moved back in that day. And you never wanted to be on the other side of their fists. I've seen it and it's, it's terrifying. So is there any connection between the Wu-Tang Clan and hip hop? I think they are the greatest hip hop group that ever was. I think that one of their, other than their music and Riz's production and everybody's exceptional lyrics, they made a huge contribution to the global culture. And that is, they didn't create the intersection between hip hop and Asian culture but they celebrated and honored it in a way that it never had been before. You know, um, a lot of breakdance moves come from Kung Fu moves. A lot of the early MCs called themselves Grandmaster after Kung Fu movies. But Wu-Tang Clan elevated it to a completely different level. I mean, the fact that they're called Wu-Tang, they're named after Wudang, which is a mountain in China, in Hebei province, and it's a sword style. And they call their borough, Staten Island, Shaolin. I mean, everything was around Kung Fu movies. They sampled Kung Fu movies. 
And I think that if it wasn't for Wu-Tang Clan, we would not have the Rush Hour franchise of films. I think if it wasn't for Wu-Tang Clan, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon would not be the success that it was in America. Wu-Tang cracked open this country's vision on Kung Fu in a way that nobody else has done it. And that was a massive cultural disruption. Mm, interesting. Is it because uh, Bruce Lee had already made a sort of a subculture on the streets of every big city in New York, I mean in America, with Kung Fu? And that then created like the space for the Wu-Tan to move in, to mix up hip hop with this street culture. Yes, it's <clears throat> Bruce Lee is for sure one of their heroes, for sure. And I often, and to your point, Ruchira, Bruce Lee, you know, he created his own style called Jeet Kune Do. So while he trained in Wing Chun with his master, he kind of synthesized a whole bunch of different styles and made his own. So I often say that um, the RZA is the Bruce Lee of hip hop, meaning that mm. the RZA took so many different styles, not just of music, but of philosophy and melded them together to create his own style. And RZA is a philosopher. RZA has traveled the world and is probably one of the most culturally curious people that I know. He's one of the most voracious readers that I know. He has studied every religion. He can cite verses from the Bible. I know that he's read, uh, we had this book that we sold at the temple called the Zen Teachings of Bodhidharma. He's probably read it 15 or 20 times. I know that he's read the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. Of course, he has read the Quran. He came up in the 5% Nation of Islam and can recite all of those lessons. So all of those things inform his music in the same way that philosophy informed Bruce Lee. Again, the most, the, the highest level of martial arts is when it is fused with philosophy, whatever that philosophy is. For those of our listeners who are listening to A Free Voice, this is Sophia Chang who was part of the hip-hop movement in every possible way. She had the highest access. She was a manager for all the artists whose names you have heard of and seen its history from a burgeoning movement to what we know of it now. Sophia, I have a question like, you know, you were there right at the beginning and you saw a culture emerge which was mocking every other music culture which existed. It was also mocking lifestyles. Mm -hmm. It was mocking so many hierarchies just mm -hmm. in the way it was and what mm -hmm. it said mm -hmm. and enacted. I want you to relate some anecdotes or incidents, you know, when which were particularly moving in those days. Well, I would say firstly that I wasn't there in the very beginning because the beginning was in the early 70s, but in the beginning of the, the burgeoning time of the industry, that is right. I would also say that I don't know that mocking is the word that I would use, Ruchira. I might say interrogating or deconstructing. And I think that in retrospect, only in retrospect, I didn't have the language or the insights to say this at the time. I think as the yellow girl in the white world who wanted to be white, getting called all those names. Also a yellow girl in a black world. Yes, uh, where I didn't get called names. It was stunning to me to see people of color writing their own narrative. Because the only time that I had seen myself on television was um, as X extras in MASH, which took place during the Korean War, and, and being mocked, like Mickey Rooney playing that terribly racist Japanese character in Breakfast at Tiffany's, or Long Duck Dong in Sixteen Candles. You know, we were always the butt of jokes. Yeah. And then here I meet 
this group of artists who did the opposite and exalted our culture. I think probably the, the story that is the most demonstrative of our relationship is very, very early on. Wu-Tang Clan were recording at Battery Studios. I lived at 14th Street and 7th Avenue, and they were at 25th Street and 7th Avenue. And I ran up to go see them, and it was hot. It was hot like today. It was August, probably. And I walked into the studio, and before I could even really say hello to anybody, Method Man grabbed me, and he was like, Sophie, you got to come and watch my video. So the first, so the Wu-Tang Clan demo tape, consisted of three songs. It was Protect Your Neck, which was the first single, Method Man, the second single, and a song called Tears. And the first video was Protect Your Neck, and then the second one was Method Man, his song, one of only two solo songs on the album. And he pulled me back into the lounge in the back where the television is, and he pops the VHS into the machine, and he sits me down. He's like, okay, I want you to watch my video. And he was, he was like, a child. He was so excited. He was just bouncing off the walls. And as I watch the video, there's somebody sitting next to the television watching me. Mm -hmm. So I have Method Man, who is six foot four, on the wall, watching me, excited to see my reaction. And then I have this guy watching me, really trying to figure out who I am. To your point about this being a very male space, to this day, I am often the only woman in the room. Definitely the only Asian woman in the room. And so I watch the video and I'm really excited. And before I can even really tell Meth what I think of the video, this guy looks at me just with, the, with this ice grill and he says, where are you from? Now, all of us know what that question means. It's not a question, it's a statement. Yeah. You know, if you ask a white person, where are you from? They'll say Dallas, <laughs> Paris, right? Um, when you ask us that, you're not asking us where we're from as much as telling us that we don't belong. So I said, what? And he said, where are you from? And I said, I don't know what you're asking me. I was playing naive. I knew exactly what he was asking me, but I didn't want to be adversarial. You know, this was such a moment for meth. And he said, where are you from? And I said, well, if you're asking me where I was born, I was born in Vancouver. If you're asking where my parents from, they're from Korea. If you're asking me where I lit and before I could finish this list, meth just flew in between us. And he ripped into this guy. And he said, that's Sophie Chang. And she's down with Wu Tang. Who the fuck are you to ask her where she's from? Don't you ever disrespect her again. I mean, and Method Man is one of the sweetest, kindest, most winsome people in the world. He is just, this is why he's so popular and so beloved. And there are a couple of things that are so striking about this incident. Number one, I'm a woman that is not his girlfriend, that is a friend and a recent one at that. And he defended me against one of his own, somebody that had known them far longer than me. But I think what's even more extraordinary is that he was very clear on the subtext of the question. He knew that the guy was questioning my right to be there. And what Meth answered was, she has every right to be here because she's our family. I have never had somebody defend me like that before nor since. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of incident that really il illustrated for me a certain kind of loyalty. Yeah. What about with people like Q-Tip? Because, you know, I've always found his lyrics very sexist. 
and almost insulting and uh, you know the who and the this and the body language it irritated me no end because now i don't even feel threatened by it anymore because mm-hmm. you know the feminist culture has moved on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but i do find it annoying that mm-hmm. someone who would understand race so well does not mm-hmm. understand sexism so well and did you have any moment to talk to him about it or think about it No, I actually didn't find Q-tip that sexist, but I'm sure there was definitely things that he said. There were people that were much more objectifying of women. I mean, I think that if you talk to all of us who are now in our 50s, who are in the industry and at the clubs and dancing and reciting incredibly sexist and misogynist lyrics, that we would all say that we loved the music. We we would sing along and say bitches ain't shit but hoes and tricks, you know. There were people that were saying much more sexist stuff than um, a tribe called Quest or any of the other folks in the native tongues. And we didn't, it didn't diminish our enjoyment of the music. For me, it didn't because I was just so swept up in the moment. And I would say probably too, and this is not, how the right viewpoint for me, I thought, well, they're not talking about me. Right. Mm. And that shouldn't actually matter because whoever they're talking about is still a woman and that's still my sister. But in my mind, in my early twenties, that was probably my um, justification. Absolutely. But we were all there. And to this day, we still love some of those songs and we'll still get up and dance to them. I will not listen to R. Kelly anymore. I won't play any of his music. I'll walk out of the room if somebody plays his music. But the rest of it, yeah, like uh, my favorite Tupac verse is on a Digital Underground song called I Get Around. And he's talking about groupies and women are completely objectified. I will absolutely at 57 jump on the dance floor and recite the lyrics to that song. And not agree to the lyrics. Absolutely. So if you had a chance now to interact with the new emerging hip hop artists, would you even think about like taking those lyrics, which were like so prevalent, you know, all of us know them, heard Mm -hmm. them, repeated them. Would you ever think of like taking those lyrics and turning them around with a feminist twist and getting the new emerging hip hop artists to do something with them? Um, I never tried to influence artists in their creative process ever. That's not the kind of manager that I was. I was a facilitator more so in terms of business and navigating the industry. That What you're talking about, Ruchera, is something more like what a producer would do. That's something more like what a RZA would do, a producer or an executive producer, like a Dr. Dre to one of his artists. I think that What I certainly would do in working with an artist is talk about their lyrics and say, um, you know, this is deeply misogynist. I'm not going to ask you to change it, though. I'm not here to police that. I'm not here to undo everything that you've ever known. I'm just here to point out to you as somebody, hopefully, whom you respect my observation and how it makes me feel. Very nice. And I know that now you are also using your own voice, your friends that you have made, your experience, your understanding, even your Kung Fu path, the Shaolin path, to do something to make a difference in the lives of others. And uh, your latest initiative is Unlock Her Potential, uh, where you have pulled together people from all walks of life to mentor younger people of color. And I suppose that the journey has come to you through this organic philosophy of Kung Fu, following your life's journey, but also your understanding of racism. So Unlock Your Potential is a program that I founded in 2020 that provides free mentorship for women of color in the United States and Puerto Rico, 18 and older. There is a floor on that age root here because we decided that we didn't really want to mentor anybody who wasn't an adult yet. By the same token, there was no ceiling to that age because at my age, I'm still being mentored. 
I believe that we all deserve mentors, especially as we get older and decide that we might want to pivot from one industry or one career to another. When, in 1987, when I worked at Paul Simon, I met Mo Austin, God rest his soul, who just passed away a few weeks ago, the formidable chairman of Warner Brothers Records. And his son, Michael Austin, who was the head of A&R at Warner Brothers Records, and he became my mentor. To this day, he mentors me 35 years later. And his mentorship and guidance has had such an extraordinary impact on my path. I learned so much from him. We also became friends, so he has seen me go through every different stage of my life for 35 years. Knowing how much I benefited as a woman of color from his mentorship, I was inspired to create this program. I think one of my discoveries about mentorship for women of color is that, first of all, just anecdotally, so few of my friends who are women of color, and so many of them formidable and incredibly accomplished, the majority of them were not mentored, and they still did what they did. Worse is that many women of color don't even think to ask for mentorship. This is what we call systemic racism, institutional patriarchy, right? So this is how white patriarchy works. It is a system built by, for, and maintained by white men for themselves and their progeny. And there's no space for us there. So we have to fight to create to create a space for ourselves in the way that I said, we have to fight to be seen, which is not fair. And yet this is the world that we inhabit. So Unlock Her Potential is my contribution to trying to dismantle this formidable system, this very potent system. And my feeling is, and I've been told this, and I'm sure you've been told it countless times, you changed somebody's life in five minutes, Ruchira Gupta. Oh, I sat next to you at this dinner party and you said this thing to me and it changed my life. I'm like, honey, I don't remember you. I don't fucking remember saying that. I'm so sorry, but vaya con Dios. And I'm glad that I could say something that could be impactful. And I've had that happen. I've had somebody say something to me, literally a sentence, and it changed my life. So if I can change your life in five minutes, imagine what we can do in 12 hours. The program is an hour a month for a year. What I knew, Ruchira, in designing the program, having managed so much talent, was that the greatest asset that these people have, because they are at the highest echelons of their- I'm going to stop you for yeah. a second here. I want you to start by explaining what is Unlock Her Potential for okay. the listeners out there. Okay. Because they don't know. Okay. So- Unlock Her Potential is a program that I founded in 2020 that provides free mentorship for women of color in the United States and Puerto Rico, 18 and older. It spans across a number of different industries, probably the most robust being television and film because that's where I reside. And then the concentric circles out from that, music, publishing, media, and then we have culinary, we have STEM, we have strategy and innovation, activism and public policy. The program consists of an hour a month for a year because what I was very clear about in having managed so much talent was that the greatest asset for these folks is time. So philosophically, I could say to somebody, hey, would you mentor a woman of color? They'd say yes, but I need you to quantify, Sophia. What does that mean? Does that mean they get my cell phone number and they can text me at three o'clock on a Saturday morning? and talk about their boyfriend or their girlfriend? No, it doesn't. It's an hour a month for a year. This is a professional guidance program. I don't actually want to talk about your shitty teenager. I don't want to talk about your partner not taking out the garbage. You can talk to your friends about that. I'm not here to be your therapist. I'm here just to give you this guidance. 
we do not offer access, let us a recommendation, job interviews, jobs, internships. I did that to manage expectations. And yet, Ruchira, as you can imagine, all of that happens organically. It's not to say that you can't do it as a mentor, but it is to say to the mentees, when you come to this program, it's an hour month for a year. Take advantage of it. Other than a handful of those mentors who are my friends, I've never had 12 hours with those people. Jim Jarmusch, one of the great filmmakers of our time, I've never talked to him for 12 hours. Michael Mann, Academy Award nominated, phenomenal filmmaker, probably to me one of the 10 great American filmmakers of all time. I've never spent more than three hours with this man. There is a woman of color this year that is going to talk to him for 12 hours. Same thing with Pamela Adlon, who bought my television show at FX. I've never spent 12 hours with her. She did that. She actually shot the final seasons of her sh- final season of her show, Better Things, during COVID. And it was crazy for everybody in production, all the protocols and all the rules and everything. And she got her mentee on set. She went through all sorts of red tape and figured out the way to get her mentee on set to shadow her. I've never been on Pamela's set. <laughs> so there are these extraordinary opportunities that happen to come about serendipitously and organically outside of just the professional guidance. And what we've done is change lives for the mentors too. These are incredible women with incredible voices and experiences. So how do people apply to become part of Unlock a Potential, either as a mentor or mentee? So there's no process to apply to become a mentor, Ruchira, not yet. Uh, I knew when I created Unlocker Potential that I was creating one of the most exquisite, exclusive clubs in the world because of the company that's kept, right? I secured over 100 mentors in less than 72 hours. I just went into my phone. This is June 2020 in New York City. For anybody that wasn't here, we were literally scared to death to go outside. Literally scared to death. We were ordering our groceries and our food in. We were wearing masks in the street. And I just went to my phone and I started calling and texting people and almost unanimously, everybody said, yes, I'm down. So there are many, many people that I know who are friends or colleagues or whom I don't know who have asked me directly or via other people, can I please be a mentor? And we have standards, right? And the standards are that, number one, you have to be very excellent at what you do, accomplished in your field, but you also have to have been doing it for a long time. Why is that? Because of the institutional knowledge. So you could be a tremendously gifted screenwriter, Mm. but it doesn't mean you know the system. Yeah. It's not just about help me be a better screenwriter. It's about how do I do this and navigate this incredibly intricate and complex world that is Hollywood and studios and networks and executives. Very true. And same thing for mentees. Like, how do you choose your mentees? So the mentee application process is much more straightforward. We're open right now. It You go through the website. You go to unlockerpotential.com. You go to our list of mentors. You figure out which industry you'd like to have a mentor in. You click on that page and you see our beautiful list of mentors and you do your research and you apply directly to that mentor. I am not match.com. I don't have the time. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't want to fucking figure out who matches together. That's part of the rigor of Unlocker Potential begins with the application. Mm -hmm. Meaning you don't just throw your name into a ring and go, you do it. You tell me who I should be dating. No, you do your research. You read up on the mentor and you go, he, she, Mm -hmm. they is the best match for me. And there are 
and there are three questions on the application. There's demographic information, and then the three questions are, what are your short-term and long-term goals at this stage of your career? Why is this mentor the best fit for you and vice versa? What are the questions that you would ask a mentor? And I would say that to me and to many mentors, the question of why are you the best fit for this mentor and vice versa, why is this mentor the best fit for you and vice versa, is probably the most salient question because that illustrates how much Research. they've researched you. Absolutely. How and serious, how well they know yeah. you. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. So, Sophia, you know, uh, you have always tried to give back and now you're giving back very, very concretely um, to the next generation and you're pulling out your <laughs> fantastic Rolodex to do so. But beyond that, you know, there are so many larger issues that we are dealing with, you know, as you said, systemic racism, systemic classism, uh, systemic uh, sexism, you know, all these intersecting inequalities which we are kind of up against right now. Do you have any uh, thoughts on, um, you know, what does freedom mean to us at this moment in history? And what is the future of freedom? That's a small question, Ruchira Gupta. I mean, I think it's different for everybody. Freedom to me means the freedom to express myself fully. Freedom to somebody else could be not being enslaved sexually. Freedom to somebody else could be, get me the fuck out of this miserable marriage. Freedom to somebody else could be, I'm finally going to write that book. I think freedom means so many different things. Freedom could be, I want to have access to birth control, and a safe abortion. There are so many different ways that we are oppressed and that our freedom is taken from us mm -hmm. all over the world. Unlock her potential can be a step in that path to freedom. Why? Because it can help literally make your dreams come true. If your dream is to get the promotion, if your dream is to write that book, if your dream is to go work at that company, we can help make those dreams come true, whether in a direct or an indirect way, whether in an intellectual or a concrete way. You know, we have all of these incredible stories. There is an Indian-Canadian comedian named Russell Peters. I'm sure you're familiar with him. He's one of the largest standout comedians in the world and a dear friend whom I adore. His mentee is 50. She is Japanese. She speaks with an accent. She is a mother of two, and she wants to be a stand-up comedian. Well, what would most people say to her? Keep your day job, honey. Russell said, no, I want to mentor her. He invited her to one of his shows, and he offered her two five-minute sets, which is an opportunity that some people would run over their grandmother in a car for. <laughs> there is another mentee named Hannah Miao. Her mentor is Katie Benner, who writes for the New York Times. She is a, an investigative journalist who reports on Department of Justice. You can imagine that her job was crazy for four years and is very crazy now. With Katie's guidance, Hannah applied to and secured a job as a markets editor, a markets reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And within this year and in having this job, we're only in August, she's had four front page stories. Another one of our mentees, Brandy Newworth, her mentor is Don Davis, who is the editor-in-chief of Bon Appetit. She got her first food piece published in Bon Appetit, something she may never have dreamed of. These are the stories that are resulting from Unlocker Potential, and these are all pieces of freedom that the program is granting to these women of color. 
freedom that they may never have even imagined existed or was within their reach. That's why mentorship is so important. Right. And, you know, you have unlock a potential. You've been a Shaolin monk. You have been in, embedded in the hip-hop world. What are the five things from all these places or experiences that make your work effective? I have an intractable belief that God, Buddha, Allah, whomever you regard as God, if you do. Or goddess. Or goddess. Put us here to be of service. That is central to my ethos. I am here to be of service. I genuinely want to make the world a better place. I believe that, and a friend of mine said this, very smart Nigerian-American filmmaker named Julius Ona, who was a mentor on year one. He said, I believe that every person deserves access to the full spectrum of humanity. That means a lot to a lot of people. I believe that you have to stay fit. My mother said to me since I was a child, you only have your health. If you don't have your health, you have nothing else. Riches, fame, power. None of it means anything without health. Sanus spiritus, sanus corpus. And lastly, I believe in love. All different forms of love all the different ways that we express love, all the different ways in which we receive love. Not everybody can do both those things, Richard. You and I know many people who don't know how to receive love because they don't know how to love themselves. I could look at you and say that you are the most remarkable creature I've ever met, and I love you. But if you don't believe that, you won't actually let me love you in the way that I wish that I could. So love thyself. Thank you. And that was Sophia Chang, who shared some profound thoughts and her life's journey with us. Look up the baddest bitch in the room and look up Unlock Her Potential and you will learn more about who she is and what she's doing. And listen to the next episode of A Free Voice with Ruchira Gupta. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ruchira Gupta, and thank you for listening to A Free Voice. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at ruchiragupta.com. The podcast is produced by Ram Devineni with Ratapalix and Bowery Poetry. Special thanks to Leela Kapoor and Anika Kothari. This podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund, which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State and implemented by Global Ties U.S. in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Additional support from New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature.